A huge round of applause for Luke Marsden from Cluster HQ, please. Cool, thanks, Mark. Nice, awesome crowd. Thank you for, all for coming. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, stateful containers and moving stateful containers from a development environment into a production environment and some tools that you can use uh, to facilitate that and also, more importantly, some reasons why you might want to do it. So why should you care about stateful containers? Um, but first I'm going to start with a, a story. So everyone here, I'm sure, knows all about microservices, but this is just a short microservices story. So in the beginning there were monolithic apps. They looked a little bit like this. Um, you had uh, one application um, with one database and it was in one flavor and it was in one place. So you could actually point and say that's my database in that rack over there and I know exactly where it is and there's one of them. Um, but obviously we are now developing applications as microservices instead. So we're breaking up these monolithic applications into lots of different pieces and so we're seeing an order of magnitude different, an order of magnitude more components but what's more, each component has its own data services. So you've got some pieces, um, uh, it basically developers are being encouraged to use the best tool for the job. So you'll see uh, some microservices have an orange data service in, maybe it's a MySQL. Another uh, microservice has a purple uh, my, uh, data service in, maybe that's MongoDB and there's RabbitMQ and there's Redis and there's Cassandra and the list goes on and on and on. And it gets worse because you don't just have these microservices uh, in production, you also have microservices on developers' laptops. Um, you also have microservices in a staging environment and um, in another cloud so that you can do disaster recovery and um, in CI and CD so that you can do continuous delivery with continuous integration. So we're getting more and more of these uh, monolithic databases being smashed up into little pieces to correspond with the microservices that are being built around them. So there's many more database instances and many more flavors. So that's sort of the, the background um, for, for what we're doing here. Uh, I want to talk about some, some reasons to, to think about trying to containerize the databases, the key value stores, the queues, as well as the stateless parts of your application. And so the number one um, objection that I get when I go around talking about stateful containers is aren't my containers stateless? I, I'm building 12-factor applications. And yes, you are, or you probably should be. I mean, 12-factor is great. We don't want to be putting like uh, state in our application tier. We want to separate our application tier um, from the data tier uh, insofar as the individual sort of containers. But 12-factor apps, I think, sort of tricks people into thinking that you should always consider the data services to be entirely outside of the application. Actually, data services like the databases, the keys, the, the, the queues, the key value stores, um, they, they're at the heart of the application. And when you're developing an application, you need to have a local copy of it running, uh, of the data service for whatever the application is running. And as you uh, move into staging and, and in, into production, um, you also need to have copies of those data services running. And so the whole promise of containers should be able to extend to that world, in my opinion. And so this brings me on to the argument that you really ought to be able to just have one platform. Let's say you've got um, a, a Mesos cluster and you really just want to be able to throw anything at it. This is sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, the promise of, of PaaS that we're finally seeing sort of manifest, is that you should be able to just deploy uh, an entire application, including all of the stateful components, um, to one single place and one single platform. And at the moment, what we've got is that we've got like our stateless bits are being handled in one place, and then for the stateful pieces, we're maybe relying on RDS or we're maintaining our databases manually in VMs or like doing it the bad old way. So let's unify these things and have one platform that you can deploy anything you want to. The other argument or one other argument is dev and prod parity. So if you're running a different version of Postgres on your laptop to the version of Postgres that you've got in production, then you're gonna run into all sorts of problems. And isn't this exactly the problem that containers were meant to solve? So 
um, if you can containerize your stateful applications, then you can guarantee that you've got exactly the same version of the code running in your database as well as in your application as you move that application through different stages of the software development lifecycle and across different runtime environments. And so these cloud services that a lot of people are currently relying on, um, things like RDS or, um, or Amazon or uh, Google Cloud SQL, they're not really portable. You can't pick one up and move it somewhere else. You can't run an instance of uh, Google Cloud SQL on your laptop. And what's more, they're not actually, the, like the product names sort of give it away. They're not quite MySQL. And they're not quite Postgres. They're like MySQL with some of Google's patches on or some of, some of Amazon's patches on. So while you gain some uh, advantages in just being able to provision them using an API, you lose the advantage of being able to uh, consistently use it across uh, and, and move these services around between different environments. Um, which brings me on to portability. I mean, this is really the, the kicker for me. This is the whole reason why we are building these portable containerized uh, stacks that can be deployed on any infrastructure is so that you can pick up that infrastructure, pick up your application and run it somewhere else, so that you're not tied into a cloud platform. But more importantly, so that you can emulate exactly the same uh, application environment um, on your laptop or in staging as you do on your bare metal servers or your vSphere or your Google Cloud or your Amazon or whatever you're using. And finally, and this is more for the, for the developer angle, um, I believe programming should be fun. I'm a developer, I'm a programmer, I enjoy programming, but there are certain parts of the job that really suck. Um, so for example, who's ever had uh, a shitty bug report that doesn't have enough information in it to reproduce the problem? Okay, <laughs> yep. So uh, that's definitely a real problem. Um, imagine if you could take uh, a snapshot of your production state um, and pull that down into a development environment. Imagine if a bug report came with a snapshot of your production state. Um, imagine if uh, you were able to uh, share a snapshot of a, a local um, development database where you've reproduced some problem with a coworker really, really easily so that you didn't have to give them a, a long list of steps to reproduce or, or manually copy around database dumps. So that's the sort of um, area that, that, we're, that we're working on um, and, and where I think programming should be, should be more fun than it is today. So I humbly submit that there are some of the tools that we're working on at Cluster HQ might help you solve some of these problems. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm going to talk about Devol, uh, Flocker, and Mesos. Um, obviously, we didn't make Mesos, uh, but we made the other two. Um, so what Devol is, is uh, a way of treating your development databases like a version control system. It's basically like Git for data. So imagine that you've got a containerized application running on your laptop that you're developing, um, and you want it to be able to type devol commit in order to capture the state of that development database and then save it for later. Maybe you put it in a branch, maybe you then push that branch uh, somewhere to share it with a coworker so they can pull it down. So that's devol, uh, and I'm going to do demos of each, each of these three things. Um, then there's Flocker, which is all about production operation of stateful containers. So when you're in development, you care about one thing. You care about being able to easily snapshot relatively small amounts of data and share them with, with coworkers. When you're in production, you care about a whole different set of concerns. Um, and you care about being able to do things like fail over if a machine fails and keep a database running that was running, on, running in a container on one machine um, on another machine. Uh, you care about um, being able to move things around so that you can uh, cope with a machine getting overloaded in production. So there's, there's lots of use cases um, there that, that become a problem when you do have stateful containers in production, and, and I'll show you how Flocker solves them. Um, and also, there are things like Mesos, and also Kubernetes and Swarm, that are these container orchestration frameworks. And they're really good at figuring out which machine to put your container on. And they're really good at figuring out like optimal placement, like initial placement, and they've got all sorts of clever algorithms for doing this at scale. But they don't work very well um, with stateful containers at the moment. But Flocker integrates with all of them and makes it easier, makes it possible to run stateful containers. So I'm going to give you a specific example of that. Um, and there's also a little surprise coming up. Um, the, so the, the, the one goal, the, the, the one sort of small um, 
wish that I have um, at Christmas is that stateful containers will improve how we develop and deploy applications. That actually by embracing the fact that we can capture the entire application and containerize it and move that whole thing around, um, that we will significantly improve uh, our agility, the ability, like developer efficiency, we'll be happier as developers, we'll be happier as operator, operations people, because we'll only have one thing to manage and we'll be able to manage it in a consistent way. So enough, enough about that, um, I'm gonna give you some demos, um, but before each demo I'll give you a, a sort of diagram that shows the use case. So the, the use case I'm gonna show you for Devol um, is here. We've got a developer's laptop, um, we've got uh, a developer's laptop consists of one thing that has some compute and some storage in it. Uh, uh, the reason for drawing that distinction is that the production environments don't necessarily have the compute and the storage in the same place. Um, but in a, in a development environment, you, you have like some solid state flash on your laptop, probably, um, and uh, you might be running a container on your laptop, and that container is um, talking to one uh, volume um, that's also on your laptop. So. Uh, as, as everyone probably knows, with, with Docker, you, you specify a volume for, um, for any stateful container that wants to write any data to disk, so a Postgres or a MySQL. So that would be the, uh, the B1 there. And so the, the use case for this sort of get for data thing is, okay, I've got like a state. Imagine I'm uh, writing an application that, does, uh, that handles real estate or, or a property website. I might insert some sample data, some houses, some flats, some apartments into, into, my, into my database. And so I've got a version of the, the state in my local testing database. I then want to be able to make a new branch of that state, and then uh, I want to be able to save that original state so that I can come back to it later for some reason. Maybe it, it, I've managed to provoke some specific bug in that, in that version of that state of that database. Um, but I don't want to try and fix that bug right now, so I'm going to save that state in a branch, and I'm going to go away, and I'm going to hurry on working, and then I'm going to work on a different branch, um, and then I'm going to make another commit uh, of that database state, um, and maybe uh, I'm going to come up with some other scenario uh, that I need to demo to a client. So I'm going to save that. Actually, it's not me that needs to demo it, it's, it's Bob. So I'm going to send Bob the, uh, the, the reference to that commit, and he'll be able to pull it down later. And then I carry on working and I've got a different branch. So it's basically this idea that you can have branches and they can share commits, but they can also diverge, just like Git. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna do the first demo. Um, does this mic also work? Yeah. Can, this, can this mic work? Okay, excellent. It's a bit easier to type uh, with this mic. Okay, um, I'm actually cheating. I'm, I'm gonna use videos because we've got a lot to get through today, but I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so Devol is like version control for your development databases in Docker. Uh, you can install it just by uh, piping something into SH, which is like the best way to install software, definitely. Um, then um, once you've got Devol installed, uh, I'll just put that over there, um, we've got a Docker Compose file here. So this Docker Compose file uh, is a very advanced stateful web application that we're going to use in all of the demos here. Um, it has a volume driver uh, and um, I'll go back to that, sorry. Um, so it has um, a volume that's been named Moby, uh, which is gonna store, as you'll see, some the location of the uh, icons on the screen as the user clicks, and it specifies the volume driver called Devol, which uh, just corresponds to the thing that we just downloaded and installed. So we've got Moby and Devol, and we can do uh, docker compose up minus D. That's gonna create the Redis and the web containers and you can see that they're running. And then we can use Devol list and that will show us that we've got uh, the volume Moby that was automatically created when we did Docker Compose Up um, is currently on branch master. And the container Redis is currently writing to that branch. So this is the new concept that we're bringing in with Devol is that volumes can have branches as well, just like you can with your code. Um, so first up, uh, I'm, well, I'm on the master branch. Uh, I'm gonna do a commit and that commit shows just my clean state. So let's figure out the IP address of the machine. It's just a Docker machine on my laptop. And I've got no Mobis in my database. You'll see how the app works in a second. Um, so I'm gonna now switch to a different branch. I'm gonna switch to branch A. 
and I'm going to put a big A on the screen. This is the very advanced stateful web application at work here. And it's storing uh, those locations of those Docker icons uh, in, a, in a Redis database. Uh, there we go. So I can now um, uh, devol checkout master, not git checkout master. So I've now gone back to my clean state. And so you have to kind of imagine this with your own app, uh, with its own data and its own database. Um, now I'm going to do devol checkout branch B, uh, checkout minus B, branch B will create the branch and switch to it, just like the git syntax. Um, and then we're going to create a B on the screen. Uh, I'm not the best artist in the world, but I have seen some people make some fairly impressive things with this app, um, <laughs> relatively speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to commit the B state. Uh, we're on branch B now. And so I can do devol log and I can see that I've got this B state uh, in the log, and if I check out branch A, I've got the A state, and I can switch between them easily. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, that's devol. Uh, I guess I'm going to switch back to branch B now. Um, so, we really, we, we've just put this out there. Uh, we launched it um, at uh, a DockerCon just a couple of weeks ago in Barcelona. Um, We've had some really good feedback. I'm really interested in feedback on it, after, like in the Q&A afterwards, uh, or come and find me after, after the talk. We really want to figure out if, if this is actually useful for people, um, what use cases you can think of uh, that, that um, you could use it for. Um, and especially, one thing I'll just plant a seed in your mind, that um, we're planning on adding push and pull support to Devol. Currently, it doesn't have push and pull, but I think it'll be much more useful once it does. So, uh, so that's, that's Devol. Uh, the next demo, I'm going to show you Flocker and the Volume Hub. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to um, explain what Flocker does. So uh, basically, with um, can I switch back to this mic now? Yeah, cool. Um, so uh, when you have Docker, um, Docker like out of the box stores uh, data that you put in a data volume locally on the host. So Docker best practices say, okay, I've got like a, a MySQL container, I allocate a volume for it, so I can do docker run minus v and specify a path on the host. Um, and so that data volume is actually just a directory. So I'm starting my container on this machine, but then if I ever want to move that container somewhere else, unlike with a stateful container, which is easy, you just kill it on one machine and start it on another one, um, uh, with, uh, with a stateful container, you've got this data volume to deal with. And so what Flocker does is it makes it possible to move that data volume from one machine to another uh, as an atomic unit. And it does that by integrating downwards with different storage systems. So for example, we've integrated with uh, Amazon EBS, if you're on Amazon, um, or Persistent Disk on Google. We've got um, uh, Dell, HP, EMC, uh, Nextenter, a bunch of other sort of on-premise storage vendors. Um, have also written Flocker drivers, and we're also working on a Ceph driver. If you don't want to spend any money, uh, then you can deploy Ceph yourself as well. Um, and so the, the picture there is um, that the user might be using some sort of orchestration framework, maybe something like Mesos, uh, that talks to the Docker daemons. Um, there's a Flocker plugin somewhere in the mix which can coordinates with the control service, and basically what that can do is it can move this container C2 with volume V2 from this physical host uh, or virtual machine to this other uh, host on the right. Uh, and the diagram on the right there is uh, the Volume Hub. The Volume Hub is just a hosted web interface that we have. So you can install some agents on your Flocker cluster and they'll push some metadata about like, which containers are running, which volumes are using which containers up to the Volume Hub just so that, it, so that it's easier to visualize what's going on in the cluster. Um, and so the use case um, for this uh, that I'm going to demo in this sort of demo number two is uh, relocating an application. So suppose I've got two databases running on one machine. This seems like a reasonable place to start with something. Um, uh, what happens if that machine gets too busy? It starts swapping or it's uh, pegging on the CPU um, or it's pegging on, pegging on disk I.O. Um, well, you might want to be able to move that uh, one of those containers onto another machine to rebalance. So pretty simple. Like, um, wouldn't it be nice if, if that was easy to do with the tooling? So um, I'm, I'll, I'll show you that. Um, I'm actually going to show you the. Is this on? Yeah. I'm actually going to show you the uh, the complete um, example of. I'm going to quickly, really quickly, run you through 
uh, the entire process of setting up a Flocker cluster, just so you can see how to do it, and maybe you'll get inspired and try it. Um, so you can go to the Volume Hub, that was volumehub.clusterhq.com, uh, and sign up for a cluster, for a Volume Hub account, um, and uh, if I can pick a sensible password, then, then I can create an account. So I then get a screen where I can create a new cluster or connecting an existing cluster. I don't have a cluster yet in this example, so I'll create a new one. And then I get this uh, uh, page of text, and I'm just going to copy and paste some of these commands. And this is going to install an installer on my local machine, and the installer has Terraform baked into it. And as everyone probably knows, Terraform then allows you to spin up some nodes on AWS. Uh, so I'm going to fill in these variables, uh, AWS secret key region, blah, 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 just sort of as an example. Um, and then I'm going to run through these commands, sample files, get nodes. We're actually working on simplifying this installer. There'll be a new version soon called Hatch, probably, um, which will also support hatching different container orchestration frameworks. Um, so I'm going to install the cluster. So I've got the nodes. Um, there they are. They now exist on AWS. And just to show you what's going on here while this installer is running, um, here in the docs, we can see on your machine um, there is a cluster.yaml that was created by Terraform, and uh, the installer is creating some certificates and keys and uploading those to the nodes, uh, installing Flocker and Docker on the nodes, and also giving them these uh, infrastructure credentials so that Flocker itself can um, mount and unmount or attach and detach the EBS volumes because we're using Amazon as a backend uh, to make sure that your stateful containers have the right uh, volumes that they need uh, when they start up or when they're rescheduled or relocated. Okay. I'm actually going to fast forward just a little bit here through the install process. And then also going to install these uh, Volume Hub agents that I mentioned. Um, that just installs a couple of very lightweight containers on each node that uh, report things like the Flocker logs um, and uh, containers and datasets. So now we can see we've got uh, a control service has shown up in the web interface. We can also see um, uh, that we have um, two uh, servers ready to have some datasets deployed to them. Uh, we haven't got any datasets or containers, but we've got some logs and we can see so the, fl cluster, the Flocker cluster is happily chatting away to, to EBS there. Um, so I can, I'm just going to skip through this bit actually, although we do show you that you can create different types of volumes here. So you can have gold, silver or bronze. And for example, gold will correspond with uh, like fast provisioned IOPS on EBS and bronze will be slow spinning rust. So uh, that's one feature of, of Flocker. Um, and then we can see this data set has shown up uh, and it's currently pending, which means that Flocker is chatting away to EBS saying, please provision this volume. No, really, please go on, even though you're eventually consistent, I want this volume, and then it deals with all that, and then the volume shows up, and you can see it's going to be a gold one. Um, so now we can see we've got this, this volume. It's a, a gold volume, and it's currently attached to a node. So I'm now going to log into each node, and um, I'm going to use uh, the same Docker Compose file that I used before. And this, was, this is important, because earlier I mentioned that we wanted to be able to uh, move the same application from development to production, even though it's stateful. So the only thing we've changed here is that we've changed devol to Flocker um, in the volume driver in the Docker Compose file. So we're now going to do Docker Compose up minus D, and that's going to be a bit quicker because it's running on AWS. And now there's a little pause here while we create the Redis container, and that pause corresponds to Flocker going and creating that volume on demand on, on AWS. And so EBS operations typically take about 20 seconds, so this will add a little bit of latency to this operation, but there you, you see that just happened. So we now have an attached data set there. And um, I'll just fast forward to the good bit. We can uh, connect to that machine and then put a big grin on the screen uh, using our very advanced stateful web application from earlier. And so what we're going to do now is, like, let's suppose that that machine is running lots of stuff and is overloaded, and we decided, okay, well, let's move the Moby Counter app um, onto a quieter machine. So uh, you can see that um, the Redis instance is uh, on this node 445, 
Um, and if we look at 445, that's that node with that internal IP, so we can go and figure out which machine that is. We can uh, kill the containers on the machine that, that, uh, that those containers are running on. And the important thing to note is that the Flocker volume outlives the containers. It also outlives any single uh, container host. So the whole point with persistent volumes is that they persist. So um, with Flocker, you can uh, then go over onto the other machine and run docker compose up minus d. And because we've referenced the same volume name, and the volume name exists inside the Flocker cluster, Flocker is sort of the source of truth for which volumes exist, uh, then you can, you can deploy that application. And um, then, uh, well, we can see here that um, the dataset Mobi is attached to this node. And if we go to the IP address of the new machine, we can see we still have our data. So, <laughs> that's nice. We're able to like move a stateful application from one machine to another. Um, so, um, I'm now going to give a demo uh, of Flocker working together with Mesos, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about why you want to do that. So, Mesos and many of its frameworks um, support HA uh, in a sense. So. You can have a machine fail, and Mesos and its frameworks will automatically reschedule the tasks that were running on there uh, on different machines. Um, so if a machine goes away, Mesos will try and uh, put that task somewhere else. And the job that Flocker does is to make sure that the volume that that task wants um, is actually there on that machine with the data that it had at the last microsecond when it was connected to that machine before it failed. Um, and, uh, and so that it can start up and the database can do whatever crash recovery it needs to do in order to get, to get back up and running. And so uh, this is the secret surprise bit. Uh, can I have a drum roll, please? I should have warned the sound guys. Yay! We've been working with the lovely guys at Container Solutions on uh, Mesos Flocker for a little while now. And so uh, today we're announcing um, the first version of Mesos Flocker. Mesos Flocker connects Mesos with Flocker, obviously. Um, it makes it possible to run any task uh, with any framework in Mesos uh, in conjunction with Flocker. So uh, it's not just dockerized applications that can work anymore. It's, it's any, any application that you can run on Mesos. Um, and uh, so for the third demo, um, I'm going to virtually hand over to uh, Phil from Container Solutions, who about 20 minutes before this talk got this working. <laughs> Hi, my name is Phil Winder, and I work for Container Solutions. Together with my colleague Frank Scholten, we've created the Flocker Mesos framework. As you're probably already aware, the Flocker framework allows you to provide software-defined storage for a number of cloud and hardware vendors. What we've done is written an Apache Mesos plugin so that your application can communicate with Flocker seamlessly. All you need to provide is a couple of environmental variables. Today I'm going to show a demo of a web application failing over, and I'm going to show the data being transferred from the one host machine to another host machine. So quick architecture overview. We've got the Mesos master, in which the Flocker control service is running, and we've got the Mesos agent where our application is running. The application is com communicating with the Flocker control service via our plugin. We're going to start our application with the, um, with the JSON command here, send to Marathon, and this is the command I'm running. It's just a demonstration um, command that's on the, the website. So if I go over to Mesos now, my application is running. And the application is simple in that um, it stores the location of these little graphics to a file. So what we're hopefully going to see is we're going to kill this, and we're going to hope it's going to hopefully start on another slave, and it's going to take this data with it. However, because Marathon is under the control of where the uh, application gets placed, it might get replaced on the same host. Let's hope not. Okay, so let's just kill it, and. Uh, it looks like it's still running on the same host. So, um, oh no, it's 
Excellent. Okay, so now it's failed on uh, host number one. So Milos is now restaging um, that task on another host. And this will take approximately 20 seconds because it takes 20 seconds for AWS to remount the EBS volume on another host. Okay, so what we're waiting for is for me just, me just to get out of the staging state. There we go. And if we refresh, there we go, fantastic. And it's got exactly the same data as the, uh, the other host. So just to be clear, uh, these are two completely separate machines. That task is now dead, this is alive, and this is the same data. If you'd like to know a little bit more about this, then please take a look at our landing page at flocker.mesosframeworks.com or indeed take a look at the code at clusterhq mesos module flocker on GitHub. Hope you've enjoyed, thank you very much. So thank you to, to Phil for making my job incredibly easy there. Um, so, uh, yeah, really, really exciting to, to get to announce this in conjunction with our friends from Container Solutions today. Um, Container Solutions are, seem to be the industry leader uh, when it comes to developing Mesos frameworks. Uh, they've even got an entire uh, brand for all of the uh, automatically generated branding for all of the uh, different frameworks, so we're, we're, we're proud to be part of that. Um, so I just wanted to sort of summarize, and I'm, I'm probably over time. Um, the, uh, the first sort of piece of this of this talk, uh, or the first part of the journey that I expect uh, many people using containers to go through, is using containers in development environments. And so there are some interesting uh, new tools that you can use uh, for managing uh, containerized development environments, and in particular the data in them. Um, so the Docker engine combined with Docker Compose combined with Devol is a pretty powerful combination, and we're going to be um, improving that uh, significantly in the coming months. To add like push and pull capabilities, um, and then in production environments, uh, you can use Docker, um, you can use Docker Swarm, you can use Kubernetes, you can use Mesos, uh, you can use the, the CoreOS stack and Tectonic and that sort of thing. And all of those things will work seamlessly with Flocker, and Flocker can be plugged into the Volume Hub uh, in order to enable stateful workloads, like controlled migrations, like I showed you in the second demo, um, uh, automatic failover, like like Phil showed us in, in that last demo, um, all with the, whatever storage solutions you're using um, under the hood. So um, I'd like to ask now, like, who in the audience is actually interested in this stuff? Cool. Um, who would actually like to try it out? Awesome. So if you put your hands up and you'd like to, then please, like, get your phone out and send me an email, just like a one-liner that says, hello, um, and uh, then we can get together and, and find a time to have a, a quick Google Hangout or something. Um, because we're really in discovery mode at the moment at Cluster HQ. We're trying to learn what people's use cases are. We're trying to learn what bits work, what bits don't, and, uh, and, and figure out the best tools to, to be building. So Luke at clusterhq.com, uh, please shoot me an email, and uh, I'd love, love to talk to you. Um, Cool, and so uh, that's it. That's, that's the talk and the announcement. Um, there's a huge list of URLs here, uh, so you can check out our website, you can check out the Volume Hub, uh, which has installed instructions for Flocker. You can check out Devol for your development environments, um, and the code for Flocker is on GitHub. Uh, you can now, as of uh, about 10 minutes ago, uh, check out the, the Flocker Mesos framework online, um, and, uh, and there's a blog post on our blog that's, that's live now with an even snazzier version of that video on it, uh, introducing the Mesos Flocker framework. I'll just say one last thing before I take questions, which is that we're hiring in Bristol. Uh, so if you're interested in working with us on, on building the data layer, uh, Bristol's only an, an hour and 20 minutes away from Schiphol. I came here this morning, it was a pretty easy flight. Uh, so please come and drink beer with us. We're also hiring if you happen to be an SF, like they have beer too. Um, but yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Can I invite uh, Frank up as well, in case there are any questions? Frank, yeah. uh, expertise needed. <laughs> Not implying that they're on stage. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. What would happen if the whole availab uh, availability zone fails? 
What would happen if the whole availability zone fails? Uh, then you'd need some sort of DR product that we haven't built yet, basically, but we're planning on it. Um, so yeah, like being able to continuously replicate data uh, between availability zones, um, that's something we'd love to add to a future version of Flocker. Um, uh, it's not a trivial problem, but we're working hard on it. Yeah. And do you support IAM instance profiles? Do we support IAM instance profiles? Yeah, for EC2. Uh, I think so. Um, we are currently working on a big refactoring that will certainly move all of the uh, cloud credentials off the nodes and into a separate agent. And I think we've, we've also had a lot of requests to be able to support IAM profiles within that agent because that improves the security model. So if not now, then soon. And please raise a GitHub issue to express interest in it and we can prioritize it. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Next question. Sorry, you're on the same road, mate. I've, I've, I've got a policy. No, no. Never twice on the same road. <laughs> you're also, yeah, sorry, it's a policy, man. Oh, I can't change it. Here we go. Come oh. on. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Okay. So um, I'm sort of interested in Devo uh, because cool. it's quite interested in the sense like you can. Um, could it be possible to like get stage, uh, staging or production data back to your uh, development machine? Yes, and, uh, that would be the actual use case, right? Definitely. So that's like we're not there yet, but that's like the vision that we're working towards here. Um, like the whole idea around what we're building, our mission is to make it possible to move uh, data around between different runtime environments, between different clouds, but also different stages of the software development lifecycle. Um, and different runtime environments obviously includes developers' laptops and CI environments and things. So, um, so yeah, you could conceivably in the future be able to take a snapshot of a Flocker volume running with Flocker Mesos on pr in production on your Flock on your Mesos cluster, uh, and take that snapshot or commit and pull that into the volume hub, and then pull it from the volume hub down onto a develop onto a developer's laptop. Uh, will this also be like um, uh, binary diff? Is it going to be a yes. div or it's going to be a oh, it's going to be a div on CFS? Yeah, we've we've got some really like top storage people working on making all those algorithms as efficient as possible and uh, introducing minimum penalties uh, for for having sort of the snapshotting layer. But yes, um, it'll be incremental. All right, thanks. That's a key requirement. Okay, now we can go back to the same row again. <laughs> awesome. That's how it works. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I, we saw the demo where you move data around with Flocker. That's very nice, by the way. Um, I'm curious if uh, Flocker can tell the difference between local storage and remote storage. Can you have policies, for example, for uh, doing I/O over the network or bringing the state on the same node, for example, where you need uh, high I/O yeah. writing to a local SSD or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the trade-off, of course, is if you have ephemeral storage, then it can die when the node dies. Um, but you might have uh, databases that solve that problem for you. Uh, so you might want to be able to allocate from your local ephemeral storage. Um, and absolutely, yes, we, we plan to support that. Um, you saw very briefly in the demo the gold, silver, bronze storage profiles. Um, I, I, I imagine that we might be able to add something like an ephemeral in, uh, storage profile. Um, and uh, we might also be able to add like NFS style storage profiles as well for when you want to share data across multiple nodes at the same time. Um, but yes, yeah, specifically ephemeral, ephemeral storage support is definitely on our, on our list. There's just so much on our list. <laughs> okay, next. Please raise a that GitHub a issue. Problem. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> that way, our product team will look at it and be like, "Oh, we should do that." Uh, great talk. Uh, Thank you. I, I would like to ask, uh, as far as I understand, you have a different driver for different storage, like EMC or whatever. Yes. Uh, but is always needed uh, the the volume hub that is hosted on your website is a web application that you hosted somewhere. Is always needed? No. Okay. So sorry, I wasn't clear enough about that. Yeah. But the volume hub is entirely optional. Okay. Um, you can use it like to get an easy view into what's going on in your cluster. But you can also take Flocker, you can download it. It's Apache 2 licensed open source software. You can download it. You can deploy it on your own private servers. You don't have to tell us anything about what you're doing with it. It's uh, fully open source, and, and we tend to keep it that way. Because we usually have a use case where we don't have internet access, but we want okay. to have container or. This is why I was asking. Great, yeah. yeah. Um, ping me an email and we can talk, definitely. Great. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, okay, we've got time for one more very quick question. Uh, <laughs> all, right, all right then. It kind of touches on the question from before. Uh, if I remember right, when Clocker started, it was all about copy and write file systems yeah. and fast driver. This is yeah. how it started. But today, you mentioned only a touch storage, block storage, etc. Did you completely abandon the idea of having ZFS, or is it already included as part of Clocker and you're just not mentioning it? We, we didn't abandon the idea of ZFS at all, uh, but we acknowledged, it was sort of a philosophical moment where we acknowledged that the problem of synchronously replicating data within a storage zone has already been solved. And it's already solved by like the GCPD, and it's already solved by EBS, and it's already solved pretty damn well by these storage vendors. Um, and we looked, frankly, we looked at like whether we could do a, a synchronous replication within ZFS, ZFS, I'm in Europe. Uh, and, uh, the, um, and that was going to be a two year project minimum. So, so for failover without data loss within a storage zone, uh, we're layering on top of something like Ceph or one of these storage vendors. Um, but where something like ZFS will definitely show up again in Flocker is when we start to talk about moving around, moving data around between different between different storage zones, between different availability zones, between your laptop and a production environment and back and that sort of thing. All right, thank you. Coming soon. All right, unfortunately, that's all the questions that we have time for. Can I get another round of applause for Luke? Thank you so much. Great audience.